uh, it's either economic or political gain. Um, and, and mechanisms like spam or phishing or identity theft, uh, all those are sort of being driven by uh, the ultimate uh, goal of profiting from uh, the attacks, the compromises, and, and the attacks that follow. Um, and uh, basically, if you look at these attacks right now, we call them layer eight attacks. These attacks are targeting applications and services at the higher level. Okay, and the problem with that is that you know I try to do something. It becomes an arms race. I try to put a defense in. The bad guys actually go find a way around it. So. Uh, the conventional defenses that we deploy at layer eight, the best example is spam. What did we do about spam? Well, we reacted to the problem after it became a serious problem, and we all this Bayesian filtering and what's the content of the spam message? Well, what did they go to? They went to images, which you can't do the same thing. So this arms race that you have, so the, the, our sort of philosophy is that layer eight attacks, or attacks that target applications, Putting defenses there actually is not the best thing you can do. It's not the most effective way to, uh, to, to counter these threats. So uh, what other thing that we notice is that these attacks, at least the large-scale attacks, are being launched from botnets. Okay, so who the attacker is goes you a long way. If It goes a long way if you understand that and what they're attacking. So with sort of these insights, let's see what happens. Botnets that are being used to launch these attacks also rely on the same internet we rely for doing the right things we want to do. Uh, they use lookup services like DNS, uh, Corey mentioned. They use hosting services uh, for variety of things. They use, rely on the transport services we have, and they need to sort of use that in a really smart way to, because their goal is to evade detection. They don't want to be found. If you can find them and do something about it, they don't succeed. So our sort of philosophy, and, and I, I think this is a really interesting challenge, is that although attacks target your banking application or your email application or whatever else you can think of, um, they produce observable behavior at the lower levels that can be detect as, detected as anomalous, different from normal, and that's where we should focus our energies on how are we going to actually understand what these large-scale threats are, how botnets actually get to our machines and our data and our resources. And, and the services they rely on, hopefully the way they do it, it has something unique about them or something different uh, that we can. So, uh, so I, I come back to this idea of monitoring. Um, at the application layer, you have all your favorite attacks, phishing, farming, spam, click fraud, data theft. Um, and we're going to run, but uh, those defenses have limited effectiveness. So what we're really focusing on is the network sensors and data get gathering and sharing at the network level, at lower layers that are common to all these kind of attacks that uh, the, the, the hackers uh, try to mount. And really you're looking at DNS scanning, for example, looking at BZP uh, behavior. Uh, and by doing that, uh, we're creating uh, taking this approach where uh, we, we have to monitor the control plane. For example, lookups are a control message. Uh, network flows that represent the activity that we're going to carry out. Monitoring hosts, what we can see there. And, and by expanding these auditing capabilities, I'm just going to flash this because uh, we're running into uh, the prayer break. Um, so uh, it's sort of building a, a system to understand this very serious threat. So we're talking about security challenges, the challenge posed by botnets. How are we going to detect those? They're bot masters. There's command and control structure. They rely on services like DNS and things like that. And uh, then it, malware is typically how they get your machines. And it's really fascinating how malware has evolved over the years. Uh, it, and we do some really interesting work in that area. Uh, if you understand all that, uh, monitor your systems, make sense of that, collect that information, uh, make sense of that information through various kind of techniques I'll briefly talk about. Uh, we built systems uh, called Bot Hunter, Bot Sniffer, Bot Miner, uh, but they're really effective. I think one of the things that uh, we were discussing yesterday is commercialization of research. Uh, this research led to a company uh, that now has 25 employees. They're building really world-class solutions for dealing with or tackling uh, the botnet problem. 
So uh, there are all kind of people who are interested in sort of where is the deep research in here. Uh, clearly monitoring, gathering data, but making sense of it, uh, classifying or categorization of it, uses <laughs> techniques from data mining, from statistical uh, uh, methods, and, and, and you know, how do you sort of establish some sort of a ground truth and what's normal and what's abnormal. There are all, all kind of interesting challenges here. So this is uh, the challenge that we have is uh, building a detection framework to get a sense of what the threats are that we're dealing with so we can face those threats proactively rather than have to react to them after they lead to significant harm that, that's going to, um, uh, we all going to suffer. So, uh, you know, there, there are lots of details. I invite you to visit uh, the center and, and the faculty's research pages and, and you can get a lot more details. I want to talk about one other thing quickly and that is what is another challenge that we have. The telephone that you look on the left hand side, this is what telephone used to be. They were dumb devices. You couldn't hack into it, it didn't run any software. You could tamper with it with a screwdriver, but so what would you do with that? So what is telephone looking like? Well, an IP phone in the middle is something that some of you may have uh, on your desks or, or homes. Uh, the iPhone on the right hand side. Now what's sort of interesting about the two on the right hand side? They're really computers and connected to networks. Uh, we took Cisco IP phone and we talked to Cisco. If you go look, uh, there's a Cisco advisory based on that. And we said, well, you know, this phone that we have here, we use it to uh, do all kind of uh, communication and, and things like that. How secure is it? So a couple of students, it's an example of a great project under the supervision of a faculty member, said, I'm going to do a vulnerability assessment of it. We didn't have the source code, uh, but you can download the firmware from Cisco public site. You're doing nothing wrong. They say, here, go look at it. This is what is running. It's running an operating system, which is sort of like the MS-DOS of the early 80s. Okay? Security is obviously not. And very quickly, we found out a whole variety of exploits, buffer overflows that uh, Corey mentioned. It suffers from the same problem. So what can you do with it? After having done, we found out you can crash the phone, you can take control of it, uh, you can do 12 fraud, you can insert a voice into a conversation that's going on. Uh, you can sniff the packets that carry the audio. So we are talking about a phone that we have trusted for a long time as a device uh, that's there for us and, and, and we can talk and, and communicate. Well, once we make that device a computer, we inherit all the problems the same thing about the iPhones or the smart uh, phones or devices that we see evolving. And we're definitely seeing it's already out there. Uh, I can send you pointers if you like, that the laptop threats are now moving to these mobile devices. This device I carry in my pocket has a lot of sensitive data, unfortunately. And a lot of the threats are driven by data. So uh, they, they want to get to your, steal your information, whether it's credit card numbers or whatever else. Um, so, uh, so we face a challenge in going from sort of an infrastructure uh, very important to the well-being of all of us and, and commerce and our personal daily lives. Uh, is it going to become less robust and brittle like everything else uh, we have had? Um, so how would you go about actually uh, addressing this challenge? We can say, well, do we have a strong sense of identity? We know who's calling, who's not calling. Uh, you know, who's accessing a device. Unfortunately, we don't. Uh, we, uh, there's a PKI effort here in, in the kingdom, but uh, phone calls are not just going to be made between devices that we have here. We all connect it, and we don't have a strong sense of identity that we can associate with all these devices. So uh, that's a good thing to have, but if we don't, what do we do? That creates a security challenge that we have. So I'll give you a quick example of, we all know email spam, how many people heard of spit? That's spam over telephony. Okay, you're not going to get spam calls. Now somebody can get into the system. So you're going to, rather than having email spam, you're going to have you know, uh, phone calls that correspond to spam. Um, it's a much more challenging problem uh, because for a number of reasons. First of all, unlike spam, where I have the content and I can filter it and process it, in a phone call, the phone is going to ring. You're not going to see the content until the call is established. Okay? Secondly, you know, my bank can tell me that we're not going to send you an email to put your information in. If you get an email like that, ignore it. 
Are they going to tell me that they never...